Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is focusing on Christian education. And this is lesson number three in that series entitled, The Law as Teacher. Hmm. This is the lesson for October 17 of 2020. And we'd like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Lord, we need a lot of education. We need to know about you. We need to know about our world. We need to know about so many things. Educate us each time we come together here, but teach us, Lord, every day in our individual responsibilities and individual places where we are so that we may come to grow more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you think of God's law as a teacher? Yes. Does he seem sometimes more the way it's presented, he's more like a judge? He's a teacher, educator. He's like a parent, and a parent has a duty to train their kids. Okay. Well, what is the purpose of God's law? Now, I wish we had the whole evening to talk about Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Galatians 3. There was a big discussion about that back in our church's history. It'll be very interesting to do that, but we're not going to do that right now. We're going to follow, follow, follow our lesson here. So what is included in God's law? That would be the first question. Is that only the Ten Commandments? Uh, many think that's true. Or does it include a larger section of Scripture? When Jesus talked about the law and the prophets, what was included under the law? Jim? Deuteronomy 6.5 Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. American Bible Society, 1992. Good news translation. Okay, so, question. Is our need to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our strength a part of the law? Well, well, if you look at the law as a prescription for life, yeah. and, and the law is a description of the way intelligent creatures are designed to function, yeah. sure, it's part of the law. Yeah. Well, was, was we're going to see even other, re other reasons for saying that as well. It was in Christ's time. Yes. Well, how do you understand what Paul wrote in this verse at Galatians 3.21? Does this mean that the law is against God's promises? No, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. Is there a conflict in thinking? Yeah, what about that? I would, I would instead of the use the word obey, I would use um, uh, listen to uh, to uh, be a willingness or have a willingness to take instruction mm -hmm. rather than obeying that obey no, it's, it's a it's a still part of the prescription for yeah. life well if the law and prophets involves all of scripture don't we believe that god's word gives life paul went on to say charles galatians 3:22 but the scriptures say that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. Okay. So what is the purpose of the law? Is it just to accuse us because we are all sinners? That wouldn't be very useful, would it be? If we already know that we're sinners. Does the law have only negative function? Or does it have any positive function? Uh, I think it has a positive one. It's proscriptive from the point of view. It tells you how intelligent creatures are going to live together for eternity. Exactly. So it's looking forward. In fact, that's the way the Ten Commandments is really understood, that is written. Thou dost not do this. Thou dost not do that. It isn't, don't do this, don't do that. No, it's, it's looking forward. You won't. You won't yeah, do this. You won't. You won't. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Jews got the Torah. Yeah. And uh, the five books of Moses. Yeah. That's what, to a Jew, an ancient Jew at least, I hope still the modern is. Jews are still the same thing. Still is. Torah is the law. Yeah. And that includes all five books of Moses, yeah. starting from Genesis 1 all the way down to the death of Moses. Would it be wrong to say it is the teaching? Yeah, it's no, that's education. Correct. Yeah, okay? it still is. But it's a, if we. It would call it instruction. 
There you go. I like that's that's okay. good. So once again, I'm going to ask you the question: Is that what you think of all of the writings of Moses when you think about the law? Well, think about what's in those five books: the story of Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. Are those part of the law? Well, think about the story of Moses. Imagine it. After 80 years of training, uh, Moses began his work as a leader of the children of Israel yeah. after 80 years of training. Maybe that gives us some of us encouragement that are getting a little yeah. closer there. Huh? Yeah. It was 40 years of hectic up and down experiences, many of which should not have been necessary. But at the end of those years, Moses had to climb to the top of Mount Nebo and be buried by the Lord as the children of Israel entered the Promised Land. Um, if you haven't done so recently, I would really encourage you to get out the book Patriarchs and Prophets. There's some other places where this story is found as well, but look up the place where it talks about Moses' conversation with God and what God said to him on the top of Mount Nebo just before he died. Yeah. Amazing, amazing revelation. Have a look at it. So, before that, doing that, Moses gave three sermons as recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. So, Deuteronomy 31. Diana? So, Moses wrote down God's law and gave it to the Levitical priests who were in charge of the, of the Lord's covenant book and to the leaders of Israel. He commanded them, at the end of every seven years, when the year that debts are canceled comes around, read this aloud at the Festival of Shelters. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt for a second. Do you think that meant that they were to read all the way from Genesis 1 to Deuteronomy 34? Or is it in what was in the covenant box? It was the Ten Commandments. Well, but we're going to read about that in just a moment. This, this scroll, or multiple scrolls, was either put alongside the covenant box or in the covenant box along with the Ten Commandments. Yes. We're going to read about that in just a moment. Go ahead, Diana. Read it to the people of Israel when they come to worship the Lord your God and the one, at the one place of worship. Call together all the men, women, and children, and the foreigners who live in your towns, so that everyone may hear it and learn to honor the Lord your God and to obey His teachings faithfully. In this way, your descendants who have never heard the law of the Lord, your God, will hear it. And so they will learn to obey him as long as they live in the land that you are about to occupy across the Jordan. Um, okay, here's your, here's your not so trivia question. <laughs> Do you remember one time in the Bible where that actually happened? It's recorded? Well, when the children of Israel left Egypt. Um, well, no, they, but no, they tore their clothes somewhere. At Josiah, uh, uh, the, they, they found the books. The, the Pharisees did it. When, yeah, it's not the time I'm thinking in about. In the Old Testament. Old Testament. Right. It's Nehemiah's day oh, and Ezra's yes, day. Yes. Do you remember? Ezra got up on a platform he quoted this section. People stood for hours and hours, and they were weeping to hear God's word read. Amazing. So, and he and and by that time they were speaking Aramaic and, and not Hebrew. So he was he was saying speaking in, in in Hebrew, and he had thirteen people on each side of him. I don't know how far they were stretched out, but they were they were translating in in Aramaic. That was the first modern language. Modern speech translation. Did he have he, the space six feet apart? Well, at least, I'm sure. <laughs> Social distancing? Well, now I want you to think, of, I, I, I really want us to expand our thinking when we talk about issues like this. Try to imagine the throne room in heaven where God is surrounded by millions of angels waiting to do His will. He's trying to decide, um, in our scenario here, I'm, He's trying to decide what directions, what instruction he's going to give the children of Israel. Now God already knows what's going to happen, doesn't he? Yeah. We believe that. Remember that we believe God knew in advance exactly everything that was going to happen in his interaction with those people. So what would you have done? Well, God gave them very clear, plain instruction about what was coming. Were they aware of these instructions? 
Was it read to them at least every seven years as directed? Uh, no. Oh, I just, uh. No, we know that there have been gaps that they have not read. But I have got a question, okay? I want to think that it was more frequent than seven years. If indeed we depended on that, then this we is, would not. This is to make sure that it was at least that often. Yeah. Well, I want to tell you, if you go to Deuteronomy earlier, it will tell, actually a little later in Deuteronomy, it says, and there's a special copy supposed to be prepared for the king, the future king you're gonna have, and he is to read it every day. Mm. Imagine if that had taken place. What a difference it would have made. And mm. if that happened, then, then he would make sure that Hopefully. everyone else Hopefully. in the kingdom would. Okay. Well, one simple uh, illustration of God's interaction with the children of Israel are the stories of their wars. As you read through the Bible, you discover that every time they went to war, following God's instructions, Things work perfectly. Sometimes they conquer nations without losing a single soldier. Yeah. That's amazing. Sometimes they, they won a war without even having to go to battle. But every time they went to war without consulting, guess God, what happened? Guess what happened? Disaster. Total disaster. How long do you think it took for them to figure out that what was the right way to do things? <laughs> I don't think it'd take too, <laughs> many, too many times. Not, if you, if, you have, if you have a big enough picture. Okay, so the question now for you out there and for us here, what methods is God using in our day to make sure that we do not forget his law? Notice that God says, first you must hear, and then learn to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Respect. Respect. And love and so Fear, fear sounds like you're scared to death. Unfortunately, it might not have been a uh, good translation. That's a old English. I thought we were told to love God. Can you love someone and fear him at the same time? Uh, well, yeah, respect. Uh, we, we, reading in context, we realize that the word fear in the Bible means everything from absolute terror yeah. all the way to respect and honor. Consider these words which immediately follow the giving of the Ten Commandments. So here's the Ten Commandments. Finishes at verse 17, here's 18 to 20. The next three verses following the Ten Commandments. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak to us, with us, lest we die. And Moses said, and notice these very interesting words from Moses. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is coming to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. Mm. Is that a contradiction in terms? Uh, he wanted to get their attention thoroughly. Well, he's, he's telling them not to be afraid, but to be respectful, yeah. to honor God. I mean, I, I, I try to picture myself. I have had the privilege of actually going to Mount Sinai and climbing to the, the one we think is Mount Sinai, we don't know for sure, and climb to the top, and I try to imagine myself, the mountain is covered with black smoke, the whole mountain is shaking, there's lightning shooting out of it, and thunderous voice comes, God's voice comes, and I mean, you're down there in the dirt with your face in the dirt, and I mean, it's not hard to understand how they, why they responded the way they did. So in light of that passage, is it possible to love and fear God at the same time? Surely if we love God, we will honor and respect him for all that he has done for us and wants to do with us. Well, if God knew exactly what the children of Israel were going to do after Moses' death, what do you think he should have said to them? Here's something clear down at the very end of Deuteronomy. Jim? Thirty-one, fourteen to twenty-seven. Yeah, Deuteronomy thirty-one. What, what page? Is it? Number eleven. Uh, yeah, just under. I don't know what else. Eleven. I must gone to sleep here. Here we go. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, "You haven't much longer to live. Call Joshua and bring him to the tent, so that I may give him his instructions." Moses and Joshua went to the tent, and the Lord appeared to them there in a pillar of cloud that stood by the door of the tent. The Lord said to Moses. 
You shall soon die, and after your death the people will become unfaithful to me and break the covenant that I made with them. They will abandon me and worship the pagan gods of the land they are about to enter. When that happens, I will become angry with them, I will abandon them, and, I will be, and they will be destroyed. I'm going to interrupt, interrupt for a second. This is one of the earliest, it's not the earliest, but it's one of the earliest passages in the Bible about God's wrath. What, do, what does God do when he gets angry? Well, it says, that, it says I will abandon them and they will I be will destroyed. I will abandon them. Okay. Yes. God, when God is angry, so supposed so called angry, or wrathful, as the Bible sometimes says, He says, "Okay, if you don't want me, I will. I'll have to step back and let you suffer the consequences of your behavior." So, I, I can't. I'm not going to force myself on you. The devil will force you if he can. I'm not going to force you. So far, so good. Many terrible disasters will come upon them, and then they will realize that these things are happening to them because I, their God, am no longer with them. He's abandoned them. I will refuse to help them because they have done evil and worshipped other gods. Now, write this, write this, write down, write down this song, teach it to the people of Israel so that it will stand as evidence against them. I will take them into the rich and fertile land as I promised their ancestors. There they will have all the food they want and they will live comfortably. <clears throat> but they will turn their way, they will turn away and worship other gods. They will reject me and break my covenant and my t many terrible disasters will come on them. But this song will be sung, it will be, excuse me, it will stand as evidence against them even now before I take them into the land that I promised to give them. I know that all, I know what they are thinking. That same day Moses wrote down the song and taught it to the people of Israel. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua son of Nun and said to him, Be confident and determined. You will lead the people of Israel into the land that I promised them, and I will be with you. Moses wrote down, excuse me, Moses wrote God's law in a book, taking care not to leave out anything. When he finished, he said to the Levitical priests who were in charge of the Lord's covenant box, Take this book of God's law, place it beside the covenant box of the Lord of your God, your Lord your God, so that it will remain there as a witness against his people. I know how stubborn and rebellious they are. They have rebelled against the Lord in, during my lifetime, and they will rebel a, it even more after I am dead. Wow. How true. And that's, that's a, a beautiful statement. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it, it, God wasn't threatening. He was just warning them what you're going to do. He even told them what they were going on in their mind. Yeah. Well, uh, one slight correction. We do this using modern terminology. It says a book. They didn't have any books no, like no, we have. That's true. These were probably four or five long scrolls in order to get all that in. And what would it be written on? It would be written on, they would take papyrus reeds from the Nile. the Nile is where they got them usually, but they must have gotten from some other places as well. Yeah. And they split them thin and they cross them like this and pound them and dry them. And oh man, what a process. Well, we already mentioned the talk about God's wrath. God, if, if you rebel against God and you're determined to go the other direction, God will say, I'm angry. But there's nothing I can do. I refuse to force you. Reap the consequences of your own choice. God is not, does not coerce. No. He also says, how can I give you up, yes. Israel? Hosea 11. Hosea 11. Yeah. And then Romans 1. Yeah, Romans 1. Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And you go to the verses 24, 30, 26, and 28, mm -hmm. I will let you go. Yeah. I'll get you go. I'll get you go three times. It's in the English poet, I forget, maybe John Donne, who says, on falling out of God's hand, it's a horrible to thing to fall in God's hand, but it's you cannot think about it. It's unimaginable to fall out of God's hand. Yeah. But really, so. that, that is an expression of the love on God's part by permitting you to do what you want to do. Because mm -hmm. he can't get, ultimately, what is it, the fruit, part, one of the elements of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Yeah. Eh? 
God is not going to have policemen and prison guards and yeah. all kinds of those things for, for eternity. Yeah, exactly. I got it. If maybe this could be relevant uh, for folk around the world. Um, once we give our heart to the Lord, does it take away our personal choice? No. no. But uh, millions and millions of Christians say, you cannot fall out of God's hand. You cannot. Yeah, no. I had a guy just today <coughs> to pick up some stuff for, uh, for, uh, to uh, deliver to him. Anyway. He, we were talking about what's going on with the thing. And he says, well, I, I gave my life to the Lord and he controls my life. And I says, no, he does not control. He provides you information and then you make a decision how you're going to live. So I, I shared something about the book of Job. So I'll, I'll see him in another week or so. And I'm going <laughs> to see is if sad. I can. It's the it, it, absolute uh, uh, the, the lie of Satan. Well, it you, is. If, if you think that God's going to control you, or, well, I've given my Lord to the Lord, and this, so then whatever I do, it must be God's will. Yeah, I can't tell you. The, the, the logic is, is lacking. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice that Moses instructed the Levites, the priests, to carefully copy what he had written and place it in, on a scroll. I put scroll, the Bible had book, next to the Ten Commandments in the Most Holy Place. Surely they must have made copies so they could refer to that, uh, to that they kept outside. So what does it mean to have a witness against us? Does the New Testament talk about that? Carrie? I'm reading from Romans 3, verses 19 to 23. Now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law. In order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. For no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make people know that they have sinned. And by and making them know, he's teaching them. He's educating them. Mm -hmm. But now God's way of putting people right with himself has been revealed. It has nothing to do with law, even though the law of Moses and the prophets gave their witness to it. God puts people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. The Good News Bible. Wow. I would, might say, if we back down there where it says those who believe, whenever we say believe, faith, trust, confidence, mm -hmm. a better word many times is persuasion. Oh, persuasion. God uses words to persuade to educate, and then when you become persuaded, it's you're settled in your mind is the, the best way to think. Well, have you ever learned any scripture songs? Yes, of course. We had a we had a lovely little book where my children were growing up, uh, short little scripture songs, and we would learn a new one every week. I love. I can still remember those songs. Mm -hmm. That was fifty years ago. Yeah. Anyone who has learned to sing hymns in church should recognize that it's much easier to remember words that are set to music. Is that why God gave this hymn to the children of Israel? Now, we, we're not going to take time to read the whole thing. It's in Deuteronomy 32. And they were supposed to memorize the whole thing and sing it at home and sing it in, at church and so forth. And now we've got to be careful what we teach our little kids in certain areas. I got that today out of the latest magazine we we're talking about. Oh, boy. There's four or five things we don't do anymore or we'll get into trouble, period. Wow. That's how bad it's got with the public. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we don't sing that song anymore, Onward Christian Soldiers. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and a few others. Very few of whom could read or write in the days of Moses at that time when writing had just been invented. Now, when I say writing had just been invented, we're talking about alphabetic writing not hieroglyphics or cuneiform. So back to our question. What is the function of the law? In addition to its instruction, it functions as a mirror, pointing out our defects. Then the gospel helps us to seek forgiveness and correct those bad habits. Very soon after Moses was gone and Joshua was in charge of the people, we have these words from God directed to Joshua. Charles? Joshua 1. Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Just be determined, be confident, and make sure that you obey the whole law. 
that my servant Moses gave you. Do not neglect any part of it and you will succeed wherever you go. Wow. Be sure that the book of the law is always read in your worship. Study it day and night and make sure that you obey everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. May I add? Yes. This is not every seven years. No. <laughs> this is every day. This is every day. These instructions seem pretty simple and straightforward. Yes. The promise that they would be prosperous and successful should have been an encouragement. Shouldn't it? So why were they so quickly forgotten? If you have forgotten the history of the children of Israel, look briefly at Judges 2 and 3. And in, that's where now Joshua is dead. He's passed on the, the thing to the leaders. And we have the judges. And it's up and down and up and down and up and down. They, they, would, they would get into trouble and they would be conquered by some foreign or organization, a foreign group, and they, oh, I, I think we forgot God. Okay, let's go back to God. Okay, good. And so God would start blessing them again. Then they, they would throw off their foreign and whew, we made it. Oh, well, now we can go back to what we were doing before. Oh, okay, whoop, we lost God. It's just Judges 2 and 3. And Judges 2 and 3, I might add, is some of the best information about God's wrath in the whole Bible. He just says, they, they, they abandoned me, I became angry with them, so I let them go. Let them do what they wanted to do. Well, are there not churches that, that follow the principles of the law of health, of law of Ten Commandments, uh, that they are really truly uh, set apart? I mean, uh, Adventists who yeah. follow, they live 12 years longer and healthier. Mm -hmm. So in our society today, is success measured by how well we are obeying God's commandments? <laughs> what if you went to Wall Street and said, uh, who's the most successful person here? Oh, you must be the one who follows God's commandments. <laughs> no, success is usually measured in our day by how much money you have in your pocket or in your account. And dollars end up in the hands of people who invent new things, who create new things, or they exhibit a lot of self-reliance. Is that real success in God's eyes? They're now having an argument about the riches of some very young singer who's too young to Good. look after own, her own finances. I mean, it is crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, Seventh-day Adventists have claimed three verses in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, as key to our existence as a denomination. Diana, I think you know Revelation something. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was furious with the woman, went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. In Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. That's the main emphasis we wanted to put he right here. But the third verse is found in Revelation 19. I fell at, the feet, at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, this is an angel who was revealing to John, don't do it. I'm a servant together with you and with your fellow believers. All those who hold to the truth that Jesus revealed worship God, for the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophet or prophets. Or as the King James says, what does it say? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy, yes. So, don't these verses make it clear that obeying God's commandments is one of the hallmarks of God's end time people? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Paul also made the point very clear in the book of Romans. Here's a couple of passages. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans 1 5. Through him, God gave me the privilege of being an apostle for the sake of Christ in order to lead people of all nations to believe and obey. And then that's at the beginning of the book of Romans and clear at the end of the book of Romans, Romans 16, 26. Now, however, that truth has been brought out into the open through the writings of the prophets and by the command of the eternal God, it is made known to all nations so that all may believe and obey. Okay. Are we doing okay time-wise? Yes. Quick question. Um, would you sometimes maybe spend maybe one session, be it here or in the Sabbath school class, um, on 
our faith in Jesus versus faith of Jesus. Oh, yes. That would be beautiful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in, in Greek, there are two ways of saying of. Uh, it can be of, whereas the word over here that is talking about is the subject, or it can be as the object. And, and there's many times what I'm sure that the person who used that expression meant actually both. Well, yeah, we'll do that sometime. I think it'll be great, yes. Suppose you're very successful in the eyes of the world and you really live comfortably and well. Is that more important than going to heaven? Remember Jesus' comments, Jim? Matthew 16? Matthew 16, 26. For what, is a, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? King James. Okay, and Mark 8, 36 says basically the same thing. So, what has been your personal experience with success? Has it made you happy to obey God's laws and do His will? Or to follow the methods, manners, and wishes of the world? King Hezekiah was one of the better kings in the kingdom of Judah. And what was his secret of success? Kerry? I'm reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 31, 20 to 21 verse. Throughout all Judah, King Hezekiah did what was right and what was pleasing to the Lord his God. He was successful because everything he did for the temple or in observance of the law, he did in a spirit of complete loyalty and devotion to God. It's from Good News Bible. Well, well, let us be honest. The devil is alive and well on this earth. And if he sees someone carefully following God's commandments, he will do everything he possibly can to disrupt that life. And why hasn't the, the devil destroyed every believing Christian on planet Earth? God's got the brakes on. God is protecting us. Yes. That is the only reason we are alive here this evening. He, he tells Satan, don't touch the life of Job. Yeah. But he didn't tell Satan, even when the Lord was probably less than a few miles away from his best friend and his first cousin. Yeah. Right? He, he didn't do anything. Yeah. Let him die. Okay, Mark chapter 6. 25 to 27, the girl hurried back at once to the king and demanded, I want you to give me here and now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. Can you imagine that? So she dances. She's at, these drunk guys asked her to come out and dance for them. And so the king trying to sort of say how wonderful he is and so forth. Oh, what would you do? What would you like? I'll whatever, give you even half of, my, half of my, whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> she goes back to mama. Mama says, ah, this is the yeah. chance. Give me John the Baptist's head. I just. But he, because he spoke the truth, yeah. he lost his head. This made the king very sad, but he could not refuse he because, because, uh, her because of the vows he had made in front of all his guests. So he sent off a guard at once with orders to bring John's head. The guard left, went to the prison, and cut John's head off. I, I just, you know, I, you, I can't imagine that kind of behavior of a government. I mean, well, you know. Nothing's changed. They were doing that not that long ago, putting him in steel cages and drowning them, etc. Yeah. Some of our friends places, in the Middle yeah. East. Middle East. Yeah. Oh, this happening. However, you know, this is uh, something that we have to always ponder. Uh, the Lord m is close. He's, we walk with Him in faith. But if He says, uh, it's time for you to close your eyes. Yeah. yeah. Think of John the Baptist's story. Preaching so powerfully that he attracted much of the nation to listen to him. It, he was, at that point, when he first started preaching, he was the the thing to do, the thing to, to hear in all of Israel. And then he was imprisoned and suddenly beheaded. Would that be considered a success story? And think of the story of Job. We've already talked a little bit about Job. Of course, Job was very successful earlier in his life with thousands of head of livestock, but then came that disaster. Why do you think God allowed that to happen? After listening to the rantings and ravings of Job's friends, 
it is essential to read Job 42, 7 and 8, and I'm going to do that right now. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. And the Septuagint says yeah. you didn't tell the truth about Job mm -hmm. on verse 8. Yeah. So. Well, think also of the story of Saul, or later called Paul. No doubt in his earlier days he thought he was on his way to becoming a very successful leader in the Jewish nation. Maybe he thought he would get to be, he couldn't be the absolute top of the Sanhedrin because that was reserved to the high priest and he belonged to the wrong tribe. But he thought, boy, he's up, he's going to be right up there next to the top. Well, you know what happened. Then there was that stoning of Stephen and then the experience on the Damascus Road. What happened between those very first events and the time later when we see him going out as a missionary is about 14 years. He went to Arabia. He went to Arabia for right. three years. Yeah. Then he came back to Damascus and then they were really angry when they heard him preaching then. They were going to kill him. Well, he had to be let down in a basket <laughs> over the wall and run to Jerusalem. Arabia radicalized but then he, him. He got, he, got to, he got to Jerusalem and they wanted to kill him. Yeah, they were. Right? First of all, the Christians didn't want to talk to him. They were scared of him. Were when scared. finally he, he got to them and they said, oh yeah, okay, fine. And then the next thing, finally, get out of here or they're going to kill you. I mean, he's, all, he's just barely become a Christian. And <laughs> everywhere he goes now, they want to kill him. Well, he has some very interesting things to say about um, what happened in those years be, that we don't, we don't know anything about, really. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a no, madman. No, let me interrupt for just a second. There were these people from the Jewish leaders who are following him around, trying to claim wherever he went, you don't have that freedom that Paul claims you have unless you become a full Jew with circumcision and following the law and all those things. You cannot be a Christian. And so here's Paul's response. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I am a better servant than they are. I've worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks, and since I spent 24 hours in the water, in Water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, mm. and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I've been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things, every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. Okay, now I want you to notice that this is part of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When in Paul's experience was that written? To the end of his life. No. no, no, quite early in his experience. He has gone through all of this. He, this, is, this is all stuff we don't know anything about, except maybe the stoning. You yes. know, he was stoned there at Lystra. He pricked uh, on the way from... That, no, that's after, it's way after this. Yeah, this is before. Yeah, but he was shipwrecked three times already yeah. here, he mentions. Exactly. But we know nothing about it. And, and, and beaten, 39 lashes three times and beaten by the Romans twice and on and on. Read that whole list. This is all before, and, and we don't know the stoning. It's possible that that was, the one thing that might have happened before Second Corinthians was written was that stoning. We know he was stoned once at Lystra and dragged out of the city and left for dead. So that might have been the stoning he talked to, but everything else in this list we know nothing about. Nothing. 
The, the stuff we know about it all came a, later than that. It must have been that he was, he really, they pushed him to write this. Yeah. Or else well, they did. Said, quiet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they pushed him yeah. to write this. Yeah. Would you be willing to go through what Paul went through? Uh. King David was very wealthy, very successful, and very powerful king and soldier. Nevertheless, he said, I would rather be a doorkeeper and the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalms 84.10. Amen. Wow. Was it turn around? Would that be true of you as well? There are others whose stories we may not even know, such as those mentioned in Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off, they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country that they had left, thinking particularly about Abraham, huh? If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. Uh. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them. Fortunately for us on this side of the cross, we have ju not just the words of God in the Old Testament for our instruction, but also the example of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Luke 2. Luke 2, 51 and 52. So Jesus went back with them to Nazareth, where he was obedient to them. His mother treasured all of these things in her heart. Jesus grew both in body and in wisdom, gaining favor with God and people. Okay. Philippians 2, 8. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to, his de all the way to death, his death on the cross. Hebrews 5, 8. But even though he was God's son, he learnt through his sufferings to be obedient. So he, uh, John 8, 28 and 29. So he said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I am not, me, that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only that the Father has instructed me say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. I go back there to a couple of uh, the previous uh, quotation or the next one bit. He learned, uh -huh. uh, he gained ins instruction. Uh, mm -hmm. if Jesus had to learn th uh, things. Yeah. Ellen White says he learned at his mother's knee and instructions that he himself had given to Moses. Yeah. Wow. So do we not only talk the talk, but also walk the walk? Kerry? 1 John 2, 6. Those who say that they remain in union with God should live just as Jesus Christ did. That's from the Good News Bible. So what better example could we possibly have than the example of Jesus? Kerry again. Okay that so-called faith in Christ, which professes to release men from the obligation of obedience to God, is not faith, but presumption. By grace are ye saved through faith, but faith, if it hath not works, is dead. And uh, they quote here Ephesians 2.8 and James 2.17. And let me just interrupt there. There's uh, an expression I think was very obvious, well, I shouldn't say very obvious, very succinct and, and, and good to remember. Faith works. Yeah. It's just a simple thing. If you have real faith, it will work. It will impact your life. Go ahead. Jesus said of himself before he came to earth, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's from Psalms 48. And just before he ascended again to heaven, he declared, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. John 15, 10. The Scripture says, Hereby we do know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He that saith he abideth in Him ought himself also to walk even as He walked. And uh, it comes from Steps to Christ, page 61, verse 2, and 1 John 2, 3 to 6. Okay, I think I just gave Charles reading away. That's fine. 
Whatever. How can we do a better job of following his example, Diana? Uh, love, the love, the basis of creation and of redemption, is the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given as a guide of life. The first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. Luke 10, 27. To love him, the infinite, the omnipotent one, with the whole strength, the mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. Like the first is to the second commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Matthew 22, 39. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind, and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessing to ourselves. Unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service, we receive the highest culture of every faculty. More and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. That's from Ellen White, Book of Education, page 16. Excellent. Very good. That's got, she's got a lot of great passages yeah, in there. Really. So what, what does it mean, body, soul, and spirit, or, or mind, heart? The whole being, the whole yeah. person. So what, what, what she's doing there is she's used different... It what, isn't just words. No. Emotion has to go yeah. with it. Yeah. The behaviors have to go with it. Yeah. Everything has to come together. Yeah, exactly. There's Very a good. quotation that says, I think it's, redemption is education, or education is redemption, something yeah. to that, if that yeah. in, in that book there. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a process. It's not something God infuses, right. sticks a steering wheel in around you, and you say, I let go and let God, all, all mm -hmm. miss uh, yeah. distortions. Well, Revelation 14, 7, and maybe I can read that just very quickly. He said in a loud voice, this is Revelation 14, obviously, honor God and praise his greatness. That in the King James is fear God. Here it says honor God and praise his greatness for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Okay? It's a very precious to the Seventh-day Adventists, that verse. Are we prepared for the final judgment of God? Do we worship him and praise his greatness? The question is, how do we judge God? Because yeah. that'll determine what direction we want to go. It's not God judging us. Remember, it said Jesus, God, Jesus says, I judge no one. Yeah. Even though all judgment was given to, to the Son, yeah. Jesus says, I don't judge anybody. You judge me. Romans 3, 4, properly, properly translated in the yeah. right translation. How many Seventh-day Adventists are striving with all their might to follow the example of Jesus in their lives? If we had a church, full of that kind of individuals, would it make a difference in the community? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. When someone starts talking about the law, do you get excited? There's so many Christians in our day who basically ignore the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, including the law or the five books of Moses. Many think the first 11 chapters of Genesis is just myth. Now, I need to stop and interrupt there for a second. In, in, in theological circles, myth doesn't mean just it's completely false. Myth is something, a story you tell to teach a lesson, but probably not true. It's just something that somebody made up. Uh, not, nice story, right, yeah. Fairy tale. Fairy tale. While it is true that the circumstances and conditions of life in ancient times were quite different than the condition, from the conditions we have now, setting aside the law or even directly rejecting it because it is not a means of salvation, is like throwing out your toaster because it doesn't vacuum the floor. <laughs> I, I love that one. Okay. Quoting again now, this is from our Bible study guide. But those who are in a properly oriented 
covenant relationship with God have no reason to suffer anxiety or aversion toward the law. Being able to say with David, Oh, how love I thy law. And just a little interruption here. If you would like to have some of these materials which we use in our class here, they're available on our website at theox.org. T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So, David provides a good test of whether one is in a healthy relationship with God and the law. If people protest with, what about love or grace or Jesus? They're in for, for a surprise. The most important law um, of all, the creme de la creme of all the laws is the law to love. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it? Yes. This is the first and great commandment. Second is like unto it. You shall love, uh, uh, this is the greatest of all laws, at least that's what Jesus taught. If people have a problem with law, do they take issue with this law too? I don't want to love, right? <laughs> so it is safe to say that there is enough endorsement from King David and King Jesus to give the law a chance as an instructor for life and a revelation of the God who gave it. Now, if you don't want to listen to David, well, but what about if you don't want to listen to Jesus? Jim? Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Good mm -hmm. news, Bible. Matthew 26, 36 and 37. 22. Just give me 22. Matthew 20, 22, 36 and 37. Teacher, he said, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So where did he get that? The verse you read right up above? Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy verse 6 as we have it now. So let me ask you a question out there. Why do you think the law has such a bad public relations image? Think of all the depressing cycles that the children of Israel went through as recorded in the Old Testament. Up and down, up and down, obeying and prospering, then disobeying and falling, failing even. Those cycles may not be so obvious in our lives today, but who suffers the most if we break God's laws? If we read the law, that is, the book of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and learn from the experiences of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, would that help us better understand God's plan for our lives? I'm sure it would. Remember that God's plan for us is to read Scripture, pray to God, and then share what we have learned. What would happen if we did that? Are you doing that? When we were young, many of us probably thought of the law as something scary. If you committed a sin by breaking one of the commandments and did not ask for forgiveness, you would be lost. Is that partly why the law has a bad public relations problem? Well, look at the hymn that Moses gave the children of Israel recorded in Deuteronomy 32. As I said, we don't have time to read it now, but get it, read it when you have a chance. It is interesting to note, especially verses 8 and 9, suggesting as many of the ancient peoples believed that different gods were assigned to different territories. That was what they believed. It is also very significant to notice, that what happen, to notice what happens when God's anger is exercised. We, we've noted that a couple times already in, the, in this lesson. He allows people to reap the consequences of their own behavior. Look at verses 28 and 29, I mean, 20, 28 through 30. So how do, you un, how do you understand verse 39, Carrie? I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. I and I alone am God. No other God is real. I kill and I give life. I wound and I heal. And no one can oppose what I do. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. It's kind of nailing I a bit, I kill huh? and I give life. I wound and I heal. Does that sound like a God of love? There might be better attention. translations out there. Well, that's a possibility. What's God, well remember, and here's, here's the secret, and again, we don't have a lot of time left, but let me just say this. 
in the Old Testament, especially early in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, we're reading from here, it was believed that anything that wasn't immediately explainable from a human perspective must be God's action. God is the one who's doing it. There's, there's, he, there doesn't, there's no talk about the devil being responsible for anything. Anything that happens that's strange and unusual, God must do it. So that's what this verse reflects. Do you have a problem in understanding a statement, a statement like, that, like that, that God kills and wounds? How does that take place? Consider how God knew in advance exactly what the children of Israel were going to do, and yet he was so gracious with them. Amazing. What would you have done? I think most of us would have said, wipe those buggers off. <laughs> you know, let's get us a people who follow God's directions, all right? Would you have been as kind as considerate as God was? Did any of the children of Israel take seriously the warnings in Deuteronomy 31 and 32? In the dirt, scared to death of God, 40 years later, Moses wrote the following words to them. I think that's you, Charles. Yeah. Deuteronomy 32, 23 to 25, I will bring on them endless disasters. I will use all my arrows against them. They will die from hunger and fever. They will die from terrible diseases. I'll send wild animals to attack them and poisonous snakes to bite them. War will bring death in the streets. Terrors will strike in the homes. Young men and young women will die. Neither babies nor old people will be spared. It's not very good news. <laughs> no. Well, he's just telling them what's going to happen because they've abandoned him. Right. Yeah. The northern kingdom of Israel reaped the results of their behavior as suggested by Hosea. Diana? Hosea 2, 4 to 5, and verse 8. I will not show mercy to her children. They are the children of a sh shameless prostitute. She herself said, I will go to my lovers. They will give me food and water, wool and linen, olive oil and wine. She would never acknowledge that I am the one who gave her the corn, the wine, the olive oil, and all the silver and gold that she used in the worship of Baal. Can you imagine learning to sing this song as a young child? Did the children ask their parents why God said that? In any case, the story of the children of Israel was a tragic one. And we're running out of time. I won't read. There's a fabulous prayer of Daniel found in Daniel 9. And uh, he says, Lord, we've done awful things, but you've been so generous, so kind. And you wonder, how did Daniel come to that conclusion, considering the conditions in which he grew up? Let's pray. Father, we bow in humble recognition of your kindness and graciousness and love. How can you put up with us? How, think of all the terrible things that have been done against your name down through the generations. And here we are at the end of this world's history. And we see people misbehaving in so many ways. Lord, forgive us. Show us your kindness, your love. Show us how we can become more like you so we may someday soon enter your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.